Air pollution is the world's largest environmental health risk. That's not me saying it, that's the World Health Organization. That's the UN um, Environment um, Division. My name is Rosamund and my daughter is Ella Roberta. She died in 2013 from one of the worst cases of asthma ever going. And on average, 25 children die every year in this country from asthma. Ella was one of 27. She wasn't the only one to die in 2013. I come from a borough of Lewisham, which is quite a deprived borough. Also, the South Circular runs right through us. The more I actually looked into this, I realised that Manchester has the same issue, Bristol has the same issue, Birmingham has the same issue, Glasgow. People in Leeds, people in Newcastle, and Cardiff, everywhere. So, and this is an, a study we published in Brazil, looking at the surface of lung of people in Sao Paulo. This is the black lung of a non-smoker in Sao Paulo. So the idea that smoking drives the black lung, of course it does, but living in urban areas does that. And we could actually calculate that if you, work, if you worked every day of your life in Sao Paulo, that would be equivalent to smoking five cigarettes a day. So that's what we're thinking is that you know, you've got your lung function grows, reaches a maximum, slowly declines as you age. What you're seeing with uh, air pollution is you're having suppression of lung function growth over the whole life course. You, achieve, you don't achieve your maximum potential and you are starting to decline from that. So if you develop a disease, you're going to have uh, yes, reduced um, capacity. This study is the Southern Californian study. It's absolutely critical. Children were followed for many years, measuring their lung function over time. Communities were a different, uh, were low and high pollution. And what they found was that in those children growing up in high pollution communities, they suppress the lung function growth. It's literally been linked to everything, from, you know, CHD, strokes, asthma, everything. And it all costs about 20 billion. I speak to people who have respiratory problems who tell me how on many occasions they can't leave their house because if they leave their house, the air that they will be forced to breathe, because you have to breathe, will, will just not let them be. And it's tragic to hear that some people can actually be imprisoned in their own homes because the air is so dirty. 50% of air pollution comes from transport. And if you ask me what should then be done, Rosamond, we need to ban diesel. You couldn't get a better delivery device for toxic material than the diesel particle. These are tiny little particles at the nanoscale, very, very small. They can get right down deep into the lung and then on those uh, particles coated a range of toxins. Because the, the uh, evidence is overwhelming, we, I launched with my colleague Doctors Against Diesel. We as doctors are very reticent. In, trying to sort of be advocates, but it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, we've got to get rid of the current toxic diesel fleet. If, if you're going to do anything, that's the, fir the first thing you should, you've got to do. There needs to be a lot more education about the impact of air pollution on health. Ozone is the most irritant gas for humans. On Sunday, Easter Sunday, was a national ozone air pollution trigger um, nationally. In Bournemouth, um, ozone hit over 180 um, uh, micrograms per cubic metre for one hour, and that triggers a requirement under EU and UK law to put out a national air pollution alert. Does anyone know about it? Well, it's not surprising, because guess what? You'd have to be an air pollution expert to find that, find the government's statement, and it's down here buried on their website. I'm probably the only person who knows where to find it. <laughs> Um, is on their statistical page where they put up passive statements. The government has not published one or distributed one press release warning about an ozone episode in the last 10 years. The government covers it up. The government covers up these air pollution episodes. When I was pregnant with my first child, I was asked to do a breathalyzer test at the 12-week scan, uh, and the results came back that I had high levels of carbon monoxide in my bloodstream. Um, and I was obviously shocked at this, and they said, well, do you smoke? And I said, no, I don't smoke, I've never smoked. Uh, and the only explanation they could give me was that I was a cyclist in London. But I felt very um, disempowered and frightened, actually, because if I was a smoker, I would just stop smoking. Um, but I couldn't do anything about the air I was breathing, and we used to live close to Brixton Road. 
Um, so I was obviously terrified having a child growing inside your body and you know that already they're being exposed to air pollution. The School Street project is basically temporary road closures around schools at pick up and drop off points and the idea of that is to encourage people not to take their children to school in cars. Trials of School Streets have started in Lambeth in the last two months. Um, we know Tower Hamlets has committed to 40 school streets trials. We need to enshrine the right, human right, to clean air in UK law. And what that does is it triggers the duty of the state to protect life. And what that means is that for every tier of government, every public authority, in the same way they have to worry about equality, they would have to think about clean air in every single decision they take. That is why this is so transformational. Clean air zones, otherwise also known as low emission zones, should be designed to prevent the most um, polluting vehicles from entering the most polluted parts of our towns and cities. But it's not enough to just you know, restrict people's access. You have to give real help and support to people and businesses so they can make the switch. Um, and we need to do it now. We don't need to do it, you know, the government has set things like targets for uh, prohibiting the um, sale of diesel and petrol cars by 2040. That's no use. We need help and support for people to move onto cleaner vehicles, onto public transport, onto walking and cycling now. How do people make it work? How are people going to afford to make that switch? Are they going to do it if they haven't got a charging point outside the house? These are all things that we have the solutions to. We can change our investments. We can take subsidies out of fossil fuels and investment in fossil fuels put them into electric vehicle infrastructure, we can do that. There will be somewhere to, someone tonight, a child somewhere in Great Ormond Street, somewhere, who will be on a nebulizer, who will be on oxygen. Just because you don't see them does not mean they don't exist. So the emergency isn't in 10 years time, it is absolutely now. What's really important is to realise that it doesn't have to be like this. Just because we live in towns and cities doesn't mean that we have to accept that the air that we breathe is dirty, that the air that we breathe is unhealthy. We have a choice. If we act now, we can do something about this problem. If we wait 10 years, there is nothing we can do other than adapt to the problem that has been created over the last few decades. This is an opportunity to not just improve the quality of our air, but also to make our towns and cities better places for everyone to live and work. It's about trying to change the relationship we have with public space and to just look at ourselves in a hard and, you know, the cold light of day and just ask how is it that we've let cars take over the roads in the way that we have. We've all accepted that cars can kill us, not just by knocking us over, but now knowing that killing us by polluting us and we have allowed that to happen. We have tackled this sort of problem before, um, as any of those who may have lived through the great smogs that we used to have just even 50 or 40 years ago will, will remember. At that point, people came together, civil society, doctors and politicians, and we got our first ever Clean Air Act and what that did is banned burning of coal domestically and by factories inside towns and cities. The dinosaurs were unlucky because they didn't know what was going to happen to them and couldn't help themselves. But we know what's happening and we know what's going to happen. I am only nine years old and there are hundreds of thousands of children, older and younger, like me. And we want to have a proper education, find good jobs, get to know our talents, travel the world, like you and your parents probably did. If you don't listen to our protests, we won't be able to do any of that. And I tell you, we really, really want to do those things. But if you don't listen, I will ask you, did the suffragettes give up? Did Nelson Mandela stop fighting? Did Martin Luther King ever stop? No. So neither will we. We will carry on protesting and striking and marching and shouting until you listen and stop burning fossil fuels and stopping dangerous emissions and saving our world. We want change! We want change! We want change!